So I want to introduce you, you to a world of wood veneer that's weirdly thin. And when I say weirdly thin, I mean 0.2 millimeter thick. Now the normal veneer thickness is 0.6, so three times thicker. When you talk to a mill worker, when I talk to mill workers, and that's been most of my career, is learning what does it take to have a material bonded to something, balance it with something, and then engineer that to a ceiling, a wall, or whatever, right? And so I'm very intimately aware of what all those costs are. Um, and I ask you, do you have any idea what millwork walls or ceilings cost? to you as an architectural mill or package. And, and so you just see a big number. And it's very often the number that gets hit by the value engineering hammer, right? Because it's so big. And, and um, I can tell you quite comfortably that, that mill work packages start around $40 a square foot for basic, basic stuff, even peeling, basic stuff and go up to at least $85 a square foot and more by the time you do sequence mill work. And we're gonna talk more about that. And that's usually in the 0.6 millimeter world. So we're gonna understand this new ultra thin veneer. Uh, we'll look at uh, some of the different technologies in which this really thin veneer is integrated with other cores and, and other, um, other assembly methods and, uh, and get a sense of how long that's being done so you know that this is no new idea, right? and uh, talk about renewabilities, of course. So we start with the raw material. And the raw material is, is the defining reality of what we have to communicate in, in wood veneer. And so whenever we have a big project, you know, I always ask our team to say, hey, we got a big job coming for Walmart. Why? Because it may take us four to six months to secure the right logs. And so we have logs, we stock logs, but if you're very specific and you have a big project and you want everything to be consistent, we want as much heads up as possible so that we can have that resource for you. And what you're seeing here is nothing new. You know, veneer um, manufacturers, you know, this is the slicing technology is not new, but what, what is new is see how thin this stuff is coming off the slicer? Uh, this is happening in Japan. Now the Japanese have gotten very good at this. Now why in Japan are they doing this and not elsewhere? Well, because Jap the J Japanese, they're an ancient island culture. Sustainability just isn't a new idea. It's, it's how they've been able to make do for all these years on this island. And so we're seeing so many great sustainable ideas in like, for example, in one of the only towns that's gone zero waste and they're teaching, they're teaching um, a lot of tourists on, on how to be a zero waste community. So um, being precise in getting veneer this thin is in part the key, but it's more than that because it's one thing to slice the veneer that thin, it's another thing to assemble it into something useful. See what they're doing right here? They're overlapping the veneer. Normally veneer flitch, that flitch that came off the log, it's stitched, but we're not doing that. What we're doing is we're overlapping that veneer and then we put it under some sort of carrier, some sort of backer to hold it all together. And then we sand that, that overlap of the 0.2 plus 0.2 is now 0.4 and now it's back down to 0.2. So by not having that stitch, it opens up some other cool technical capabilities that you're gonna learn about here shortly. So whether we're making, you know, um, uh, wall panels or, or architectural millwork panels or some of the other cool things uh, where we now have this very very flexible veneer that has less of the technical issues that wood veneer just has. In, in wood, what does it want to do? It wants to expand, it wants to contract, it wants to absorb things, right? And if it gives up too much humidity, it wants to crack, it wants to so, so if we take away a lot of the wood, we take away a lot of the technical issues, right? And we can get more from the lock. 
because the Japanese, that's how they see it. They see this stuff coming from, from far away places, uh, these logs, and they wanna, they wanna maximize that natural resource as much as they possibly can. Because sure, we can find pine trees all we want, we can find poplar trees all we want, but having that really great walnut tree, or that really great oak tree, or that um, um, Moabi lock, you know, which is this 350 year old African tree. You don't, you wanna, you wanna savor that stuff. So throughout history, wood has been in human life, whether it's heating us, whether it's a tool, whether it's um, uh, housing us, uh, we have a, an intimate relationship with it. Now, uh, from a decorative standpoint, we can go all the way back to ancient Egypt to, to see that here, just like the Japanese, they're working with these logs who have come from elsewhere in the world, and they're savoring this resource. So they're, they're treating uh, these wood veneers much like they would treat semi-precious stones because of the difficulties in obtaining that resource. Now we know that using veneer is, in general, a sustainable way of using the log, right? So if we compare um, uh, typical 0.6 millimeter veneer compared to hardwood, you're gonna be using, the hardwood option is using 17 times more um, wood of that species, at least 17 times more. If you're comparing it to the 0.2 version, you're using 50 times more of the tree. That's not factoring in all of the other waste that you lose when you cut hardwoods. But then there's the technical aspects of it, because when you're working with a hardwood, it wants to move on you a lot, right? And, and so, so that was the other reason why the industry was moving towards the veneering, was because they wanted to control, maybe it was a, like the American piano industry, was one of the earliest uses of wood veneers in, in North America because they can control the shapes by, by using layers and cross banding and doing early versions of plywood. So could you imagine trying to control a product you know, way back when, when they started to do this versus the technologies that we have today like you saw in the video. Now wood is, um, it's our great renewable resource. It's a great carbon store. We shouldn't be afraid to use it but I think we should be cautious how we use it. And I think that's, that's always the message in any sustainable story is consume things in a way so that nature can replenish themselves itself faster than you're consuming it, right? And you know, we talk a lot about greenhouse gases, etc. Uh, I think we just need more trees on the planet. That's a great solution, right? So, so if we consume responsibly, uh, we can we can still use wood and still grow more trees than we're consuming. Now this word Moltenai, Moltenai is uh, like I was raised with uh, waste not, want not, right? Finish all the food on your plate. Um, and and that's that's integrated in the Japanese culture at the very very beginning. Uh, Moltenai is also kind of what their uh, Africa, this Wangari is movement that's happening now in Africa for sustainability is pushing this same, um, the same, you know, show regret when you create waste. Because we should. We should be mindful about everything that we touch because there's an environmental cost that we just keep pushing to further down the road. But let's shift away from sustainability and talk technical. So what is one of the advantages, technically speaking, when you slice the veneer really, really thin. Well, back in the 1970s, for those of you who were fortunate enough, uh, fortunate enough to afford a Trinitron TV, we were not that family. Um, but, you know, this was a premium device. And it had natural veneer on the outside of it. But the case is metal. And, and what happens when you make a TV and you put it in a shipping container and it's going around the world. Well, it's not climate controlled, so it wants to bubble, it might crack, you know, low humidity, high humidity, etc., etc. And then the other thing is these TVs got really hot. So they had two issues. They had the humidity issues and they had the temperature issues and it was causing the veneer to fail. But if they got the veneer thin enough, it didn't. And there was another industry that really benefited 
from getting the veneer really thin because you weren't going to climate control your Toyota. In the 80s, if you, could, if you had $35,000 to spend on a vehicle, you wanted real veneer on your dashboard. And you certainly didn't want it to crack and peel away. And, and micro-thin or ultra-thin veneer was the solution to that problem. Now, for the last 50 years, I know, you know architects, there's, there's, there's sort of this divide between architecture and interiors, right? So there's this world of interiors materials um, that can solve some problem for you. And this veneer to direct to drywall is one of those options. And because we want wood in a lot of places. We want wood because it's calming for us, right? We know whether we're in a space because it's a work environment, maybe it's a transport environment. I'm living in airports uh, too much and I want to be in these lounges because they, they give me nice premium surfaces and they're calming. So, so uh, and we know this is the one material that never goes out of style. I mean, yeah, maybe one season we're using more walnut. Right now, walnut is, is the species. Uh, second in line would be rift white oak. Um, then third in line, I don't know, we could, could throw a bunch of different species at what, what's next, but I would say more than 60% of all the veneer that we see being sold right now is either a walnut or a rift white oak. Um, then, you know, teak, yeah. paldeo, a bit. Uh, That's a maple. Yeah, maple, cherry, they're different. You know, then it, then it becomes, where are you? The Canadians, they love their maple. They'll never shake that from right? Then there are parts of the country that still love their cherry. And then other people look at it and go, oh, cherry, I can't handle it. Because sometimes, and, I, and I, what I've learned about uh, fads or design trends is the stronger the design trend, the more it shifts away in a very sort of strong fashion, right? So because it almost defines the time period. Is, is um, But here you have a millwork package, right? So this is not veneer direct to drywall. This is a millwork package. This is one we're very proud of. It's Alice Tully Hall in Lincoln Center. Um, again, as I mentioned before, one Moabi log over 2,400 sheets of veneer, all sequenced. Do you know what I mean by that? So as we sliced it off the log, everything had an order. And that order, as it was sliced off the log, maintained itself as it moved through the project. They also call it blueprint matching. So we can partner with, with, with our design um, teams and say, okay, what's the species? In this case, the, 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 uh, the design team flew to Japan to look at the lock. Okay, who's up for a 16 hour flight, right? But it's, you know, when you have this high level of connection for premium spaces, um, it's something that we can step outside the norm with these micro thin veneers because maybe you don't want it bonded to your typical MDF like you have up here. Maybe you want it bonded to a red acrylic so we can backlight that. Now the space is really gaining a whole nother feel. It's coming alive. And then maybe you've got some metal fire doors there that you want to contact cement to. So you've got three different technical backers. So remember when I say that the veneer is being sliced, it's really thin, and now it's being overlapped and it needs some sort of carrier. Well, maybe that carrier is fleece and paper. Well, everybody does that. Or maybe it's a translucent backer. Or maybe it's an aluminum foil backer that can, can allow you to go to a substrate like drywall. So let's look at the millwork. What is it to do millwork? To do typical millwork, it's usually an MDF. There's ultralight MDFs, there's fire retardant MDFs, there's particle boards, there's a whole industry of cores. But it's still a tree, it's still a lump. And normally that's three quarter inch or 20 millimeter. 0.2 millimeter veneer, 20 millimeter, right? That's one one hundredth the stuff of wood. So now we have this sandwich. And whatever you put on one side, you gotta put on the other side. So if you're using a 0.6 millimeter veneer, which is your typical millwork veneer, 
got to use that same thickness on the back side. That's the balancer. Now, it doesn't need to be a face grade or a premium veneer. It could be have knots in it. It can have some impurities and so forth, but it should be the same species, right? So now you've consumed double the amount of that, that tree um, just because you need that balancing layer. And then the MDF course, a lot of that's our recycled content or sawdust, basically, that's been uh, milled back into, into, a, into a, a, a structural form. Then you got some sort of Z-clip or French cleat, uh, which is your budget Z-clip. And now this panel that weighs about three to four pounds a square foot needs to be engineered and hung to something that can support that weight. So this is why this cost of millwork starts at around $40 a square foot. Because the guy to install all this, that labor rate's around $15 a square foot. That's just the labor. Minimum 10, right? People don't realize that the mill worker to spray urethane, to spray three coats of a, of a lacquer or a urethane, that cost to the mill worker is anywhere from six to, to nine or even as much as $12 a square foot. That's not the veneer, that's not the panel, that's just the spray, okay, to, to seal it. So this is why these things can, can add up. Oh, if you want radius work, oof, that's another premium because that curve core, um, that's, uh, that's not cheap. Uh, or a lot of labor to get those curvatures. But so that Alice Tully Hall, that was a $150 square foot millwork package. Not cheap. Not everyone has $150 a square foot to do millwork. This one's $30 installed a square foot. What's up? What changed? Same, similar premium veneer, A grade species in sequence. They cut out little holes there for the sound to transfer through, right? And, um, and you've got all this really complex radius work and it's only $30 a square foot. When you take away the MDF, you take away, take away the balancing layer, you take away the complex Z-clip, and you just take the veneer and you bond it directly to the As far as the client is concerned, the owner of the space, or the patron that walks into this theater, they see beautiful wood, they're impressed, it's a great space. And so if, if you can achieve a veneer direct drywall and get the same look that you want and you just did it for one quarter of the cost about you did it in about half the time and you did it in about 150 at the natural resource so the last I heard our owners our clients were concerned about mostly time and money first and foremost and uh, so these are these are veneer direct drywall so uh, reminding you or just sort of refreshers things you probably learned uh, at school What's a flat cut veneer? When we take the, the log, we cut it in half, and then we slice that um, uh, parallel with that, with that half cut, and you have a very angular um, attack from the blade through, that, through the growth rings. And that means you can get all that character, all the cathedraling uh, in, that, in that wood. To do a quarter cut means you have that log, you quarter slice that log, and, and now the blade is cutting very perpendicular to that growth ring, so we get much more linear consistency. You don't get all that fire or cathedral in the, in that, uh, in, in the veneer. Then the rift cut is normally on oaks, and it's still that same quarter block, um, but, but it's on lathe, and the, the blade is hitting it at a radius. So it's just a, now a very, very tight, linear uh, cut. And again, these flitches, now we have to assemble them. Uh, we'll get to that in the next slide. Rotary cut is the lowest cost way to slice a veneer because we peel the lock. This is your Home Depot plywood, right? It's, it's, the, it's um, uh, and they call this puddling in the industry because there's no way to get book matching or any real kind of consistency when you have rotary cut. There's another uh, thing in the wood business called recons, or reconstituted mirrors. You guys heard of that? Uh, recons are the industry's way of, it's kind of a hybrid of a wood, the wood industry to laminate, right? Because laminate is a print. But in a recon, what we do is we rotary cut veneer, we'll stain some of it, we'll, we'll like, it's like baking a cake, a layer cake. So we'll, we'll 
dye some of those sheets of rotary cut veneer and create a, what's called a block. So this is a recon block. Then we can slice that again. So when the market is looking for consistencies that are unnatural, right? So let's say you're gonna do phase one, and then two years later you're gonna do phase two, and then three years later you're gonna do another phase, and you want everything to be the same. The recon is the best way to give you consistency and reproduce that in a natural way. Make sense? So then we have this flitch. How do we match? The book match, everyone's heard of that, right? So you open up pages in a book, and so you have the mirror image in the, um, in the graining. But there's something called barber polling. So for highly reflective species, Maple and cherry are, are, are two of the culprits of this, I should say. In that, the, the, if the light is refracting one direction and then, it's, and, it's, and then the opposite, or the, the neighboring piece, which is now book match, is ref, refracting the light in the opposite direction, so now it looks like a different tonality. Now this may be okay, this may be okay for your client. Um, the thing about barber polling is the log may not barber pole, and then as you slice through the log, it may start to, right? So it's, it's, not, it's not like, oh, that log's gonna barber pole. That log may have some barber pole within it. So you have to be okay if you're book matching based on the species, and we can give you some consultation on that. One way to avoid that is to sub match. So you just slide the, the, um, the uh, pieces next to each other. Another uh, comment I see a lot of this nowadays is the uh, random matching because we want a lot of the variety. So it's just a question of understanding your client's overall goals. Do they want a lot of natural variety here or do they want a lot of consistency? Um, and, and even in there, you can dial that into, into uh, uh, defining in the consistency, do you want a natural or do you want a recon? So we, I kind of have to have some of this dialogue with folks so that we don't install the space and well, well that's not what I wanted, right? We don't want to have those conversations. Uh, random match is actually more difficult for a factory <coughs> to do because somebody actually has to look at it and make it make sense, right? Because it's easy to just follow the order as it came off the log. It's another different thing to actually look at it and say, all right, we'll put a couple light here and a couple dark there and wide flits there and narrow flits there. So, so when you're you're producing, when we're producing a veneer, we give the client total control, right? And we want to know what your overall goals are at the at the project, because if you're going to have a 40 or 50 foot high wall, and you want that to all be consistent, now you want that veneer to be end matched, right? So, so if this is sheet one, and that's the top of the sheet. This is the bottom of the sheet, and this is uh, sheet uh, two. You're going to actually turn that sheet upside down so that the bottom uh, parts of those sheets are matching. But these are things that we need to know as we're assembling the flitches, what the final uh, goals are of the project. But when you're playing with little strips of wood, we can play with them in all sorts of creative ways. So whether it's a sunburst pattern or we're doing block patterns or random patterns, this is this is why the communication of your local rep is so important because it's not just picking a sample out of a binder and saying, I want that. It really requires collaboration, that we're a partner, the, the, whole, the whole team is a partner in your project because then we get to what's called the live flitch conversation. So we can use that sample, that control sample that you chose three years ago when you were, you're having those initial conversations with your client but now it's time to pull the trigger. It's like, okay, what logs do you have? Those logs, that's what's called a live flitch. The, the raw material, the resource that we're actually pulling from to produce the finished sheet good. But by taking the veneer direct to drywall, it means that we can afford to put wood in spaces we didn't think we could afford to put it. Because this is less expensive, quite frankly, than putting laminate on the ceiling. Because you can't glue a high pressure laminate to, to a ceiling. You, you can do vinyl, of course. But um, but my own experience, no offense to vinyl, um, is if you wanted wood in the first place and you wanted wood because you wanted that calming effect, 
um, that wood gives you, that connection to organic materials. The only way you're going to do that is with the natural variances that you get with wood. That, that's, that's where you maximize that, that calming um, sensation. Now here's a big recon project. Uh, this was one of those uh, 1,600 sheets of cute sheets, 13 foot tall by 3 feet wide. And the factory managed to end match them, um, as you can kind of see it there, so that the installer just needed to step up on a stool and drop the sheet from ceiling to floor, right? All this radius stuff, that would have cost a fortune in a millwork package, but direct drywall can be done very inexpensively. So I want to show you how this all goes down. So we start with the clay base adhesive, that primer to your drywall, and then you goop up the back of that sheet. And just like in millwork, you want to have your substrate needs to be good. Uh, in this case, if the substrate is drywall, you want it to be a class four or a class five. Uh, if you always ask for five, you might get four and, we, and everything can still work. But if you ask for four and you sometimes get three, we may start to have some issues. Materials, the AC uh, systems need to be on, so the humidity levels can't be too, too low, they can't be too, too high. And the product should acclimate. And what I love about these videos is that me as the millwork guy, selling, you know, being responsible for a wall panel system, millwork system, yeah, I knew to, to get this installation done, we had to have a shop set up on the job site. So I met table saws, routers, skilled carpentry guys that knew how to do precise measurements, precise trimmings. Uh, there was detail profiles, uh, always some sort of reveal to deal with that extra gap or some profile to hide the cut edge, you know, all sorts of different stuff. With this version, now instead of having the big shop and all the skilled laborers, you have a wall covering installer his tools are a razor blade, a stool, a sponge, and a bucket, and a straight edge. So, it you just you these two men are able to do the entire corridor in this hotel in a matter of a day. Uh, scribing a panel, a millwork panel, is very time consuming and requires a lot of skill. Here, it's a straight edge and a razor blade. The owner of the hotel just wanted wood on the wall. They don't care if it's a millwork panel or not a millwork panel, right? And they also wanted you to stay within some budget that is constantly a moving target, right? So for about $15 installed a square foot, you get this. To do these very complex areas in millwork, that price would have been north of $50 a square foot easily, and much more time consuming. Okay. The other cool thing is, you know, uh, outlets. And anyway, he's getting, uh, getting to the wire here. Right, you know, coordinating with the, the electrician and, and the other trades, and uh, he's got his, his outlet. Uh, always in the laminate business, I always had stress cracks coming out from the outlet. Why? Because the electrician would come and he would take a um, uh, you know reciprocating saw and just hog out a, an area for the for the electrical outlet, and it never was mindful that you needed a radius in there to prevent stress cracking. So, so I always that was always my claim that I had. So here, easy um, to to address those situations. Okay. A lot of people tell me they find this very calming watching this, this getting in this kind of like zone. So, but then you've got other substrates, right? Maybe you just got a bunch of metal doors that you want to have that are all in sequence uh, with your with your wall cover. Well, here's the same material. Because it's so thin, it easily wraps around um, uh, 90 degree corners. So what you see here is a simple metal fire door, getting contact cemented. Uh, all your mill workers have gotten very comfortable in this country with spraying contact cement. This could even be done on site. So you spray, uh, and you can use water base, you can use solvent base, either way. So once you, with contact, you spray both surfaces. So they sprayed the door. Here they, they sprayed the back of the veneer. And they use a slip sheet. That's what you see there. That slip sheet, just a piece of cardboard. So now one guy has you know, got the, the sheet of veneer um, in position. And the other guy starts to pull out the slip sheet. 
and then they put pressure and then it makes that bond. And then just keep pulling that slip sheet out and, and applying pressure on it so it makes that bond. And then when you get to the edge of the door, you just take a moist uh, rag and you soften the veneer a little bit with some moisture and you wrap it. And you've got a premium veneer in sequence with everything else. And by the way, this can be done on the frames too, right? Uh, or if you wanted to do a, uh, you know, a manufactured profile machine version, uh, you know, that's what that is. <coughs> when uh, outside corners here, just fold it over just like you saw on that door. When you want to have the um, reveals so that it looks like it's an architectural panel, it could be just as simple as specifying a, a reveal, a drywall reveal. This is a two-part system, so the top piece actually covers up over the over the edge. Uh, this was installed by our customer service people, right? So it doesn't require a tremendous skill set. Here's a project that was uh, over 10 years old. Since, uh, I took the photo recently, and obviously high traffic environment, using a budget reveal. So on the right, you have the budget plastic reveal where the it's just been trimmed with a razor blade, and then you have a two-part aluminum system, uh, but those are both directed drywall. In this case, you've got 60% uh, savings from the mower package because they they took it directed drywall and but kept the reveal. This is just uh, folded in, as you see there. And then when you get to the uh, perpendicular to the grain, that has to be cut. So you can fold parallel uh, at 90 degree, but then when you get to the perpendicular, it should be cut if it's a hard knit. Want to put wood on a ceiling? It's just, I mean, why go through all that complex engineering to make sure that that panel that weighs who knows what is going to stay up there? So um, very cost effective, easy way to get wood onto a ceiling and maintain your fire class. Or be very creative. Uh, when you have multiple substrates, right? So you've got your drywall, you've got your MDF case, and then you've got your plywood door. No problem. <coughs> contact cement, contact cement, um, drywall adhesive. We can also put peel and stick uh, adhesive on it. For some uh, of the wall covering guys, we just did that for an elevator. They had a bunch of metal elevator doors that were old and they wanted to remodel them. So we just put a, a repositionable peel and stick. Uh, so they can put it up like contact paper. But it's still, you know, high quality premium veneers. So radius work, very easily done, cost effective. Digital print, so if you have wayfinding or logos you want to incorporate. Uh, so inlays can get pricey, but digital print can offset uh, that cost and give you a very similar look. We're now offering block planking so that if you want that pattern or you want that look of a, of a uh, typical wood flooring or, or a wide plank, uh, we are now creating that as a sheet good. Very easily done. And then uh, remember that Alice Tully Hall where we showed you the backlight uh, option? So we're seeing a lot more folks that are sandwiching, they're wanting, they're wanting us to put the veneer in a, in a glass sandwich, or they want to put the veneer um, uh, with a acrylic backer uh, for a variety of reasons. Now I show you this photo not because you got you know, you know, two, two old dogs of the business. Uh, one owns a glass company, the other one owns a, a veneer company. Uh, the guy on the right is the veneer guy. But 10 years ago, these guys got together and they figure out how to do the house Tully Hall. So when we collaborate within the industries, we figure stuff out. And once we figure it out, we say, you know what, let's, let's offer this, what we've learned, for everybody else. So when you bring your ideas to us, know that there's, we've probably done this someplace else, and we're happy to do it again for you. Uh, this, this blew up the internet. This was um, Beijing Starbucks, the largest Starbucks in the world. Now, uh, that's bonded to metal on acoustics. So this is a, this is a perforated acoustic uh, metal tile. And when we bond veneer to metal, 
it we don't have the humidity issues. Uh, you know, so so a lot of those things that challenge us in mill work are not are not the same challenges uh, in this case. And I know you guys are paying too much for your lattes because there's another Starbucks in Tokyo, uh, similar idea. So, and when we get to these big atriums, you know, these are notorious spaces where it just you just can't control humidity, right? It it's even if you put all the air controls on, you don't know the humidity here is different than the humidity there. And then the mold, the seasonal changes, it's it's a it's a it's a millwork disaster, basically. And I've seen how in these type of situations, um, failures and bonding the veneer to metal offsets those issues. Right? And so here it's to a new simple ACM or to, to an extruded metal like that. Okay. In this case, um, you take care of the fire issues, you take care of the engineering issues, and you take care of all the humidity challenges in that space. You guys ever heard of CITES? Anybody? One. Cool. Um, you've heard of FSC, right? You've heard of Green Guard. So you've heard of all these third-party entities that basically cost money. CITES doesn't cost money, but it's actually one of the most important environmental um, governing bodies that we have because CITES is what governments pay attention to when natural resources are being consumed faster than they can replenish themselves. So if recently, Tamo Ash, which was the wood species that started this veneer company 100 years ago, right, is now being tagged by CITES as being um, overconsumed, level three. What that means is it's on the watch list. What does that do for us? It means we stop promoting it to you. If we have the stock, we'll sell it to you, but we stop consuming that tree. If it goes to a level one CITES, it means it's illegal to trade that species cross-border. And, and you might have um, not realized, but when you were uh, first ordering chili and sea bass, when that first started going on the menu, it was the Patagonian toothfish. Well, get flagged on CITES, and so the, the chili and sea bass that you eat now is not the Patagonian toothfish, it's some other or fish it's being pulled off as the patty of the two fish. So there's, a, there's, there's well over 100 species of woods that we can be consuming. But we have to be mindful of how we consume them, and CITES is a great way for us. So, so when one day we say, oh, sorry, we can't do that species for you anymore, it's not because we're a bad factory and we, we just, just decided to discontinue it. No, it's because we're trying to be mindful in the way we consume these natural resources. So these sorts of projects are things that we see all day, every day. Uh, this particular one is directed drywall. We can absolutely be putting beautiful natural species of wood in an ecological way, consuming about 1 50th the natural resource. These things can be done in about half the time of what it would take to, to go through all the shop drawings and negotiate your way through an architectural millwork package. Uh, we, we, you can have total control whether you want to use the sap, not use the sap, go with a random match or not, 400 square feet is all you need to completely create a veneer that works for your project in every way. Um, the cut, the assembly of the veneer, the sheet anywhere from like a 3x8 all the way up to a 4x13. And, and I always encourage you to be mindful of sequencing because if you don't order your veneer in a sequence format, you can get patchwork like this. Right, and uh, and that's what we want to avoid. So, so in conclusion, guys, you know, I want to say thank you for sticking it out with me. Oh yes, of course. Um, I'm going to give you two. Thank you. Thank Sorry, you. Yeah. No, no, of course I understand. So, you know, here you've got to direct the drywall, and and look what you can achieve, and keep your budgets in check, and keep the environmental uh, consumption in check. Here you have micro perforated acoustic samples uh, or acoustics up in there. Uh, you've got these incredible, you, know, you couldn't do this in architectural millwork because you're limited by the sheet size, right? But if you're not, if you take away that limit, 
and you can easily do those seams wherever you want and not even see them, now your visual of, of panel becomes wherever you want to put a drywall reveal. So we can open up a lot of really cool uh, design capabilities for you as well. And in the end, um, to achieve my environmental goals, we can, we can still have our, our cake and eat it too. We can, we can use these beautiful woods in our projects and, and still uh, uh, consume a lot of these trees. So is this beneficial, guys? Cool. Uh, just a quick, quick recap. I am uh, 